that activation oh and they're, they're doing the, they're down in a squat and they're walking sideways like a duck with the band around their ankles <laughs> I'd rather get injured lads than have to go through that shit. <laughs> Mickey Hart here, you're listening to GA Hour Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet, it took me a long time to get here. So the master fixtures schedule is out, um, lads, for 2020. And some of the standout um, headlines from it are little changes um, from it. These are these little changes that's going to push this status quo through Central Council. We might get to that um, in a little while. But the 2020-2021 club season semi-finals are set to take place next December. Right. So this year, they're obviously next in January. In 2020, in 2020 the semi-finals will be in December and 2021, the final will be in January. So if they're fixing that there isn't too much chance of that being ripped up with a brand new um, kind of uh, schedule that this fixtures task force or restructure that this fixtures task force is after setting out another change is the Leinster football final and the Munster football final one of the two will be on a Saturday evening so Leinster football final this year is on a Saturday evening Munster final is on a, a Sunday and that'll alternate year on year that seems to make sense to me under the current structure that none of us want um, the pairings for phase two and three of the Super 8s will not be fixed until we see the outcome of the first round. So the winners will play the winners, the losers will play the losers. That will obviously make sure uh, teams will, more teams will have something to play mm-hmm. for on the last day. And that makes sense as well. So these are these incremental changes that John Horne's going to make sure to make to get his... Uh, restructure the status quo from the fixtures task force through there's going to be a five week club window between the end of the National League and the start of the championship that's going to be a club window Uh, we've spoken plenty about that club window how do you prepare prepare for the championship like I mean it's bizarre and the under 20 football championship as we know now is going to be moved from f- into February and March so Conan and Connor are here with me as usual um, they're the kind of standout ones from it but they're the little changes some of them are good changes but then, then we have our tier 2 next year and these are these incre- I'll keep repeating myself the worry is that these are these little improvements that are going to be made to push through the status quo option which is one of the three fixtures task force recommendations and get that through. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my brain is a bit fried trying to process it all. To be honest, and when I was looking at the what all the changes today, I, I was trying to think to myself, how many times has the calendar in the GA changed in the last few years alone? I was trying to think the hurling championship, the new hurling championship, the Super Eights, uh, club month uh, being introduced, uh, the club finals being changed, the All Ireland finals being changed, and this is within what the last five years. So I know, as you said, that the the intention is always positive, but I think it's a it's an acknowledgement or a recognition that the the whole fixtures. Uh, Situation is a bit of a mess in the first place, but you know, hopefully, we'll get to that uh, coming on with, with with what the CPA are trying to do and stuff like that. But just interesting as well that the the when you said the club championship semi finals are going to be on in December, so I just think come you know October November next year there could be carnage in terms of trying to get club championships and provincial championships finished in time. But at least hopefully that will put pressure on various county boards to plan in advance and get those competitions finished in time. How much faith I have in those county boards to do that, I don't know, but hopefully we'll see. Yeah, all, the, all this without shortening the inter-county season by a little bit more probably is going to be very difficult. You know, like, I mean, next Saturday on the 7th of December, this Saturday week, the O'Burn Cup, the early, in, early season competitions start. Do you know what I mean? Like, this needs a radical overhaul. Like, these incremental changes won't work. There's too many, it's, it's too messy. So I got an email from uh, 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 Pat Heffernan. He's a principal in a school in Mallow. And he's given out, from the school's point of view, of the under-20 being moved back until February, March. This is how complicated this thing is, that this didn't even enter my head. That this is completely impacting now on schools football, which senior school football is now under-19. So there's a massive crossover there between that and the under the under twenty competition. So he says to me in an email, as you're aware, inter county football under twenty competitions will now commence from er, earlier from two thousand and twenty on. This is a disaster for second level competitions at provincial and all Ireland level. Schools competitions at senior level are now under nineteen, but any lad on a county panel will be under savage pressure to mix both. 
Last year, our school, Patrician Academy, uh, won the All-Ireland Sea football for the first time ever. It was huge for GA culture in our school. We also won the Cork College's Senior Football and Senior B Hurling, four trophies on school in school, which was amazing. So he's the GA coordinator um, in the school. Um, and they have actually now taken the decision not to train any of our senior teams as the lads are still involved in club competitions, minor, under 21 football and hurling so like I mean imagine saying in your school for the welfare of your players we're not going to train at all because there's too many of you playing in other competitions <laughs> yeah that's not right it's look it's not an easy fix with any of this but we did say that may, potentially under 17 under 20 should be merged and played during the, the senior championship there'd be no club on at that time and if you're playing under 19 you can't play senior and mm. let them run parallel mm. Like the minor and senior championship, and let them play on the same weekends, and they can't cross over and take them away from schools. Play them in the summer when they're not talking about the leave insert. You know, like June and July, or after the leave insert in June and July, run it off. Then uh, there is a way to fix this. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Just moving them uh, to cross over the, the school competitions. I don't know. I didn't think about that. And yeah, I'm just conscious that like, if we do try to fix things and we make a bit of progress, there's always another competition that we throw in there. there. What about mm. the schools? Or like, you know, but that's it. But that's, I suppose, a negotiation. And I was talking about the higher level schools being in the negotiations. But now secondary school need a representation yeah. mm. to make sure that they get their piece of the pie. And this, like, this isn't a new phenomenon. It's very unfortunate for a school like that. Like, but I think back to 2002 when Mark Lynch was under 16 playing for Derry Miners, playing Hurling for his club, playing under 16s, playing Miners. You know, when you play with all these different teams, and that's 17 years ago, it's like if you're the best players, unfortunately, that's they what do, happens. But I don't think it should be, unfortunately, that's what happens because you see hip problems in later life, knee problems, no, like all know, that. Like that's you, overtraining, and it's playing too many matches, and it should be alleviated. I don't think. You yeah, know, but it, that's it. But he it, has to prioritize. He's like, you can't like the the, the It's not easy for a 16, 17 year old to no, prioritize. I don't think he that's should not have their job. But, like, but your complaints are that like you know the competitions are all like you know they're running into each other. But like his way to like you know go around that he has to play for all of them apparently like he either has to prioritize not train or we're saying that every competition has to be three weeks long. Do you know there's too many competitions? Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. I just don't don't put the under twenty merge under seventeen or nineteen so you don't have the the mess and then take them away from the school year and play them in the summer and play them the exact same time as the senior inter county because no club activity will go on at that time. You know. For me, logically, that's solving a lot of these problems straight away. Do you know what I mean? Cause I do find, like, obviously, a, a player should prioritise, but Jesus, you can put a guilt trip on a 16 year old. Oh, yeah. Do you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we all did it because you love playing at the same time. It's not like the 16 year old is even complaining about this, but it, for the good of the 16 year old, you know, he shouldn't be asked to do it. The 16 yeah. year old would be mad to play. I think it goes back. Like, I thought the task force's remit was going to be, like, you know, working off a blank canvas and, you know, changing everything from there. Unfortunately, that's what it should have been. But then the vote for the tier championship seemed to have scuppered that because I did see some of the like reports that the 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 sort of what the tier championship or sorry, what the task force were working on. They were talking about flipping the championship, like what you had suggested before. Yeah, bringing but, the yeah. but they're two of the other suggestions. The worry is that they, they're not going to get well, through. They can't get through now, like, yeah, because yeah, John Horn rushed in this... Well, no, they can get through. It's John Horn is bringing the three proposals to Central Council. So they all get equal... Um, equal footing at Centre Council yeah. but the issue here is after these little changes and the GA president behind one of them and you know yeah. be let's, heavily, let's, heavy keep, lobbying let's keep the status quo the, yeah. like none of these delegates will want change the problem is that these other two and the CPA are much more behind the other two they're not negative against all three yeah. they're just really negative against the against the the status quo one because it's interesting that the CPA now that you mention them they're trying to block this thing. Well, not block it with Central Council. Like, they're rattling cages. They're really smart, the CPA, um, when it comes down to it. So this is Tommy Kenai, who is a a Kilmore club man, and he's also a CPA uh, member. So the Roscommon County Board have passed the motion, and they've asked the GEA um, top uh, officials to put put its proposals to the to the clubs of the of the country. So the motion wants the clubs to see the task force recommendations and make a decision how to mandate their central council delegate before a final decision is made. So rather than the, the delegates go to this meeting, we know what delegates to these things are like. It's too much, you know, they, they kind of do what they like mm. um, and they might be influenced. That Tom Ryan sends every club in Ireland 
these three motions so that they can be studied and that the, the county board delegate can be sent the ca- yeah. central council delegate can be sent and mandated to go this is what we have decided mm-hmm. that's democracy that's not just a delegate deciding on his own back that is the clubs mandating him now obviously how do we know does he follow that mandate when he arrives there you know that's GA politics but that's the CPA being smart about this and maybe trying to take some little bit of control back from this central council which I agree with them this is a done deal if this reaches central council without clubs getting involved and saying hang on a minute the status quo is not what we want Mm. that's the last thing that should be decided on let's try for one of the other two so I I thought it was a I thought it was a smart um I thought it was a smart uh, motion that Ross Common have passed. So he he's asking the, Tom Ryan. He says that the recommendations of the fixture review task force are issued to all county boards by the director general for consideration by the clubs in advance of being brought to central council. Smart enough? Yeah, I I just I just wondered then about the timeline. How long would that take to to do before they have to for all the to present out all county boards for all the clubs to consider and then to get back with their submissions? Like, have we enough time? Like, there should be enough time. It's made been to be put do back. It. It's been the central council meeting has been put back okay. because of the CPA pulling out. So I don't know how far it's been put back. Well, I'm just like even after reading what um, it would have to be pulled put, put yeah. back until clubs yeah. mandate and have seen them, which. That's again. That's democracy. That's yeah. what ha- has to ha- should it's a, happen. It's a delay, but it's a necessary delay, I suppose. But like, um, I suppose what's go- what's good about what what Tommy Kenoy did, did as well. It just reminds, it um, it just makes clear again how how good it was that the CPA did what they did last week and pulling out of the process and making a big kind of song and dance about it. Because had they not done that, Tommy Kenoy wouldn't have raised this motion that uh, in Ross Common, and we wouldn't be in the situation where we're looking at all the county boards across the country being been shown all the proposals and not just the status quo one that uh, John Horn wants to wants to implement so like th- this could this could hopefully end up being the the CPA's greatest achievement if they end up showing up John Horn's plan they ushered the tier 2 in for the facade that it that it was yeah no exactly Remember we talked before about getting rid of Congress, so <laughs> you just send your emails in and everybody votes that way, yeah. you know, based on what the club have actually said, and so it's not on the whim of a Well, delegate. that's it. So the clubs, the, clubs, the clubs all vote, the county board tot up the votes, which way do we vote? This way. Send that into Congress, no delegate. <laughs> You don't mm. need that Congress. Yeah. You don't need that. That you could all be done probably on, you know, online. You can't see how the delegate is voting anymore because uh, yeah, they hit con- Congress wouldn't, they hit wouldn't allow the emotion yeah. for, for it to be so shown the delegate, to everybody. The delegate can just play his own game and do, and do what he wants. It's yeah. not democracy, lads. It yeah. is not. Unanimously defeated from what I can remember as well. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 exactly. So, like I said, the O'Burn Cup uh, starts and the pre-season competitions. I always say O'Burn Cup because that's what I played. Um, so, Kevin Feely was ta- has been talking about the pre-season competitions. So, they play, they play Longford um, and then play Wicklow a week later. It's mad that it's been pushed back. So, he's, he's given out. He says, the GEA didn't shorten the calendar at all by bringing the all and final back a month. Well, back three weeks. They just moved the preseason tournaments back a month. <laughs> so we laughed That's at this fair, yeah. this time last yeah. year. It's gas. He says, no one likes it. It means you have to go back training earlier. It will just lead to teams not treating them as competitive matches because it's too early and teams not entering in. Uh, they would be better without them. And from a player welfare point of view, it's probably not ideal. So like, just think about this. The league starts in February. If that was the start of the season... Teams would start probably training back the start of December. You'd do a little bit of, you know, casual twice a week on the field, doing some long distance running, and then you ramp it up through January. Now these are starting on the 7th of December. Teams are back in October. Do you know what I mean? Just give them bloody September until Christmas off, pretty much, to live their own lives and do their own thing. And they'll all stay in shape these days anyways. Why drag them back to group training for a competition to start in the 7th of December because I know people are saying oh it's only a pre-season you won't take it serious there's a lot of players will take that very serious because mm. they have uh, there's a hierarchy in the squad that they want to climb up yeah. so it's easy you can't just say that and there is a difference I don't know if you like, well, you obviously played pre-season competitions there's a difference between that and playing challenge games like the, mentally ah there is yeah. it's much bigger and it just takes more of a toll and you've got a set schedule you know it's not in your own time anymore and yeah when you're doing that from December, like it's, it's an official game. Oh, it's grim. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's an official game. It is completely grim to be back um, on the 7th of December and feel he's very strong on it. And look, this is all just, it's all a load of, it's a load of nonsense. Like, I mean, why, why would they bring it back into the, into the, that calendar year? 
why not just get rid of them? I haven't heard of anybody who talks, except for someone like Dick Clerken, who's in the pocket of the GEA. You mm. know, who has a good word to say about it? What's the point of them? They're an irrelevance. I really don't know. I was actually thinking about this today, and like, obviously, the, 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 like, they're good to remember, like, you know, GA legends, but you can do that in all the ways about having a competition that everyone's scoring at. Like, do you know, you can have, you know, a that the money goes to, the, like, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, but the GPA have stuff like that as well. Exactly. Like, if we can do it without having this competition and not a competition that everyone's complaining about, and yeah. we can frankly do avoid. The, the only thing that I would say for the minute, like, I, I'd be an advocate of getting rid of them as well because something has to give. Like, we're just talking about the fixtures. There's so, like something has to give at the end of all, and the most easy thing to call would be these pre-season competitions I suppose it gives management it gives the players as you said a chance to maybe you know go up the hierarchy of the squad and it gives management and maybe even fans a chance to have a look at it like a, I've, been, I've been to a few pre-season games for example FBD games for Mayo because you know there's a lad from the club for example who might never get a chance and then he gets a chance to play in the FBD and he mightn't get a chance again after that so yeah. and, and then uh, uh, people that will defend them will point to the crowds I mean I think it was a couple of years ago where there was like something at like 10,000 at a, de- at a Arma Tyrone game or something like that yeah. but they're not there because of the quality of the competitions they're there because they're GA mad and they're yeah. probably available to go at that time of year so but like just when and you then, but I think the first round of the league will be much bigger then because oh, they're well, yeah, always absolutely. first round ones yeah. you know people are just they've, they've, been, they've been starved of intercounty yeah. action yeah. for four months starved them for five months yeah. in the league <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. exactly. I, I wonder how many players have actually broken through in the Oberon no, Cup lads, you would lads, break through in the let's league let's be anyway. honest you know the good players in your county exactly, yeah. I don't know any player that we've said Geez, if it wasn't for the Auburn Cup, we'd never have known yeah. about that lad. It's a lot of nonsense. It's a myth. It's a myth. And they, they, every county now plays A versus B matches and lads show up in them. And that's the reality of it. Like Leash now have conference games yeah. as trial games. They're showing up in that. Then you'll play A versus B games in training and now you're hitting into the league. Yeah. And you don't, they, oftentimes in the Auburn Cup, they'll try eight lads that never have a chance of getting on. In the league at least, so the eight lads now are not playing on a strongest team that yeah. they could have. Are they really yeah. getting the right chance? So in the league, because it's more competitive, two or three might get in. And they have a much better chance because they're playing with 12 more established fellas. It's a much, look, they over, these early season competitions are just such a nonsense. They're, they're, they don't serve any purpose yeah. other than you saying, Connor, a lad that's never played for the county might get the odd game. Jesus. Do you know yeah. what? Well, sorry if that if we're losing out on that. <laughs> and I'm not putting that forward that argument very strongly no, just no, to say. No, you know, but I know the point you're making. Yeah. Like it is, like different lads get to wear the, the county colours. But like, I mean, that's... I wouldn't be too strong on keeping that tradition. Uh, don't, don't a lot of the proposals for the for the for the fixtures task force or the ones talked about for the CPA recommend getting rid of these? Oh, so, everyone would know, be so outside of the status outside quo. Outside of the status yeah. quo, yeah. do you know what I mean? So that says a lot too. Yeah, it does say a lot. So Desi Moan and Vinnie Corey, two Clontibret men, both retired. Desi Moan hit Twitter uh, yesterday afternoon and Vinnie Corey said, look, we'll give him an hour or two and then I'll, I'll uh, give him his moment of the sun and then I'll hit, I'll hit them with mine. So two absolute stalwarts, two of the longest serving players currently and the, the, the most appearances, two players for Monaghan. So Corey started in 03, uh, Desi Moan started out in 04. Um, there was a, a stat from Colm uh, Shalvey, the journalist. He says, Vinnie Corey goes out with a county record of 184 senior appearances. He scored 525. How do people tot these things up? I always have a, a bit of admiration for someone who actually sits down and tots this. <laughs> Vinnie Corey <laughs> texts him. <laughs> Less <laughs> Vinnie does, yeah. But I wouldn't know what I, like, I wouldn't know my appearances are very low, uh, I'd say. Yeah, I'll tell you, I remember totting up something before <laughs> about top scores. Steve McDonald goes straight on to me, saying I scored 10 more points than that. Really? <laughs> yeah. Classic. He had totted him up himself. Ah, yeah, but look, yeah, he prided himself on his scoring. <laughs> yeah. I'd be more embarrassed of my scoring. But like, I mean, Desi Moan had 171 games and he scored 144 and he says they're Monaghan's top two for senior football championship appearances with 63 and 58 so there's some serious um, numbers two real two fans favourites two legends um, Desi Moan said I just didn't want to be sitting on the bench or running up and down a sideline I didn't want it to end that way so I just felt it was the right time that sums it up for me like I mean you've been such an important player you don't want it you don't want your last memories of being an unused sub. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You want to go out in a high and they both won a county championship their seventh this year and 
probably felt right for the two of them just to, I'd say they might have decided this over a pint after the county final <laughs> I'm not I don't think I'll go back will you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no do you know what we'll do we'll announce it on Twitter yeah. an hour of it <laughs> together <laughs> yeah I thought like because you don't like statements I thought like Desi Moans is perfect just two words Shane yeah and then uh, Jesus like I thought if Wooly likes Desi Moans he's really going to like you know Vinnie Corey's where the club just announced it for him yeah in yeah. the middle of two the retirement statements so Vinnie Corey didn't actually announce it in a way but I um, love that though like I mean just get out yeah yeah you know, thank you. Thank all the people you want to thank in private. Like, I mean, it's not, it doesn't mean that much to for the big long statement. Do people really read those statements? I don't anymore. I don't. They, 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 go, they follow the same template, exact same. Yeah. I think the GPA have one and plug the sections in. They all the same. They all follow the same. The same. Just wanted to get the acclaim from their fellow teammates and like fellow players throughout the county on Twitter. Then for the couple of days afterwards, maybe I don't know. But uh, as you said, I think the way they did it was. I think the way they did it was great. And just to say about the two lads, the when you say go out in the high, I don't think their standards ever really dropped. Like even when they started kind of getting towards their mid thirties. I think you um, was it last summer. I think you put out a tweet for a county the the size of Monaghan to yeah. have that generation of players that included Finney Corey, Desi Moan, Conor McManus, considering the population in the county they probably won't see their like again no and like I mean Vinnie Corey's a bit of a freak in that he can do a brilliant job for you as a mark and centre half back he's done it on Michael Murphy like I mean if you want a man just to follow a man he can play centre back orthodox mm-hmm. and he can do a great job for you full forward which he's done at inter-county level do you know as well as club level so like I mean we talked about versatile players and I don't think we threw Vinnie Corey into that yeah. uh, into that mix I think, me, sorry. I think he's played on every line of the pitch for Monaghan he yeah. played wing forward he played full forward midfield full back I was about just about to say apart from maybe Aidan O'Mahony in the 2014 final I can't remember too many people doing a better job American Michael Murphy and he did it a few times oh he did it a few times yeah they had their matchups against Donegal in those days um, they had them bang on because Drew Wiley used to take up Colin, Mac- Colin McFadden and he couldn't get any change mm. out of him when he was at his best and Corey would take on Murphy and he'd get nothing out of him now there were defensive games so they had help back there as yeah. well you know and it was the other Moen uh, uh, or the other Wiley Ryan Wiley would pick up McBrearty bang boom 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? we have you we have you uh, kind of checkmated there so I was thinking the longest serving players in the game now Stephen Cluxton Freak of nature, 2001. So he's by far, the, well, by far the longest. Niall McNamee's back in the mix with uh, with um, Offaly. He made his debut in 03. I think he was a Leaving Cert student against us in Moor Park. Um, it, it, that was a draw that day. And Ross Munley, I think Ross could have made his debut the day, the game before that against Wexford in 03. So there, unless David I'm Clark, missing anyone. 2001. David? Is David Clark still today? Yeah, he was on the panel in the Mayo team that won the league in 2001. All right. He's the same as Cluxton. There's no separating of this. No no intention (laughs) to retire neither as far as I know. So I think he's back again for next year. Right, okay, very good. Um, Right, Killian Clark, he's fallen out of love with the game. This was in the Anglo-Celt this week. So he says, this is happening. We've mentioned this before. You have Ben McCormick going travelling, Kevin Feely, or not Kevin Feely, you have... um, Daniel Flynn, Daniel Flynn going, sorry. you have Darren McFeety. So Kevin are in, in trouble. There's different examples of fellas just taking a year out and taking time out. And we know the commitment um, at this stage. So he says, I've been involved in nine years at this stage. Um, it's a decision I didn't come to lightly. I want to take a bit of time to myself and evaluate what my life is going to be. Very sensible talk out of him. He said, I heard there were rumours that I had a falling out with the management. That's not the case at all. I just fell out of love with the game a wee bit, to be honest. I wasn't enjoying it. I just want time to concentrate on myself, to look after number one for a change instead of putting football first like I've done for the last eight or nine years. I completely understand that. Unusual that he wasn't enjoying it coming off a very good run yeah. to an Ulster mm. final for Cavan, you know, and some great games and like, you know, he was doing really well on uh, Rian O'Neill and stuff like that, you know, so it is unusual that it's this year he decided that, but the idea of just concentrating on myself, deciding what I want to do in my life, instead of getting on that roller coaster where your life just goes from one championship, bit of club, looking forward to next year and never actually going, hang on a minute. Do I want to change jobs? Do mm. I want to like it? Okay, if you're mature enough and you're you're kind of I don't know, you've kind of got that ambition and stuff. You can do both. But some people need, maybe need to take one step away from this passion to try and find what your passion in your real life is. What's going to be the rest of your life? It's very hard. Like I guess there's a lot of players reading that, and it's probably striking a, a chord with them. Like because like even club players, I think they just you know they revolve their lives around. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday, whatever it is, like, and 
and then everything else just sort of tries to fit in around that. But they're yeah. they're blocks that don't move, regardless of family or your work or whatever. It's they're the things that you talk about having to run down to get your car to drive down to leash and stuff like. There's people doing that all over the country and. Yeah, I'd say like, you know, <laughs> him saying this is probably shining a light on a lot of those people. Maybe they're all thinking themselves a wee bit as well. But yeah, it is strange that he came off the back of a personal great season too. And the game was sitting him. It wasn't like, you know, a corner forward. He's like, fuck this. I'm not enjoying the game anymore. But yeah, I think it'd be better for Killian Clark though in the long run because well, he's 26, so probably mid-career now. So like if he go went away even for a year, maybe a year and a half, two years or something like that, he'll come back. His appetite for the game would be far bigger than it is. Like even yeah. when you mentioned Kevin Feely there about the O'Byrne Cup, can you imagine some of them thinking, Jesus Christ, start of December, I'm doing the Bur- O'Byrne Cup. I'm just not ready for it. Yeah. I know I'm not ready for it even as a as a, as a a fan, you know. So I think like give him, if he takes a year out, he might decide to take longer. But look what it's done for Paul Mannion did it for China. Uh, not, I know different circumstances for some of the Dublin players, Rory O'Carroll a bit longer, but then they come back with a renewed appetite to go again and they're yeah. not. Well, O'Carroll's not, not a good example for that. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, he would have got it back he in the played, team or any well, other he team. He played think, against so. Tyrone in the last Super A game. Yeah. Yeah. No, no <laughs> squad after those two games. Yeah. He, got, he didn't get a great, uh, he wasn't great that day, but Tyrone were sending in some lovely diagonal oh, balls. Well, not it. easy, yeah, yeah. you know. But uh, that's the thing. Even Austin Gleeson was talking about this week in the media was about um, Waterford being out so early last year and going to America and he played with Tipperary in America in, was it, where was he? Um, I think he was in New York and, uh, you know, just really enjoying that, getting away from it and coming back this year then with a huge new appetite. Do you know, like, I mean, that's important. Now, I know that it's not really a break because you're playing out there, but like, you know, this is like playing yeah. intermediate at home for a fella who's an intercounty player. It's yeah. just easy going. You're not being killed. There's no pre- There's no huge pressure on you, depending on how much money you're getting. <laughs> 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 so like, I mean, a little break like that is good for players and they need it. They need it. And some of them don't get it at all. Just to finish up, lads, we talked on Monday about the Boris Ali, the cockerel or the, the cock, cockadoodle-doo that they have as a mascot. And a fella texts me after, and I'm a bird brain, I, I don't remember a lot of stuff from my career or whatever, but he says, I'm surprised you didn't mention the cock at the game in 2004 um, against Cross McGlenn. So we played Cross McGlenn in, was it 04 or 05? 05, 05, maybe the semi-final in that January. And it was this leash fan got into his head, he was bringing this cock to leash games and he was throwing it in on the field during the game so it was causing a little bit of embarrassment at the time to leash I don't want to mention uh, your man's name so he came to our All-Ireland semi-final against Cross McGlenn and we've no association with this fella he's a leash fan he's not from Port Leash and he starts launching this cock in onto the field <laughs> during, our, during our match against Cross McGlenn so as it turns out one or Francie Bellew or can't remember one of the McEntees had to take the cock <laughs> off the field and you know put it away or whatever so like Port Leash Club would have been a bit embarrassed about it, but he wasn't one of our supporters. But the Leash County Board were very, very worried that this was going to spill over. We beat Cross McGlenn that day. We were in the all Ireland final in Croke Park. And they were worried that this fellow was going to bring this cock up to Croke Park and yeah. <laughs> launch it in on the field and cause, may- yeah. <laughs> cause mayhem. So they were debating this over and back in, in true county board fashion. They were like, well, what are we going to do? And then one of the administrators, I don't want to mention to him, he says, look, enough of this, lads. It's not like Croke Park are not going to see a lad coming up the road with a big cock in his hand <laughs> and you're going to let him in. <laughs> the whole county board just erupted and your man, like, he was a little bit put out by it. And I just I just thought it was it was funny to mention that. Like, yeah. I mean, it's a classic. Croke Park caught by surprise. Surprise. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll talk to Connor Laverty next. All right, so the Ulster final is the live game on TG Cahir on Sunday. Um, it's Kilku versus Nave Connell, and we have Kilku's captain, Connor Laverty, on the line now. Connor, how's it going? Uh, not too bad, really. How's things? All good, all good. Come here, before we get into the interview, I want you to confirm or deny this quote. In Kilku, you go to Mass, have a few sheep and play football. Confirm. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many on the team are sheep farmers? It is all the Brannigans anyways, we know that. Uh, the whole, uh, there could be five or six of us. Right. You're not, though. You're in Trinity. You're a, a GEA uh, coordinator in Trinity College I am I am but uh, my hobby would be farming <laughs> sheep farming yeah and come here like I mean do you get the piss taken out of you and down look I know you're dominating down club football so your rivals can't say much really you know you, you have an answer for them pretty quickly but I'm sure team or opposing teams draw on this no 
Not really, sure. That's, that's just the way the way it works. That's just life, that's it. You just get on with it. Yeah, yeah, true. So come here, tell me about this uh, job down in Trinity. You're, you commute from Kilku down to it. Yeah, yeah, up and down, yeah. Okay, this is my, I've been there, this is my ninth year now, so um, it's very enjoyable and listen, we're, we're making good strides. Listen, we're up against a lot of stronger GA, um, more predominantly GA colleges throughout Ireland, but particularly in Dublin, but Trinity Sport are putting a massive emphasis on putting good structures in place and we're now, GA is now one of the performance sports, so we're getting a lot of benefits from that as well. Right, okay, and how long is the commute? Uh, it's about an, an hour and a half each way. All right, that's not too bad. It's, it kind of sounds bad when you hear it, but an hour and a half's not too bad. No, it's not too bad, and it's once you get to Newry, sure, it's perfect down the road then. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Come here, you're completely immersed in the GEA because your day job, like we've just mentioned, is GEA. You're obviously captain of your club, and you're over the minor team in your club. I was reading that when you were 16, you were over the Kilku under 12s. I, we, I just remember it was 16, 17 um, we managed under 12s but um, I've been over our minors now this past number of years and we were lucky enough this year to, to win the minor championship and we're, we're looking forward to the first round of Ulster now in two weeks time That's two weeks after this Sunday? A week after a week after it actually Right, okay so what do you do outside of GEA? Um, <laughs> do a bit of farming and spend time with my wee boys <laughs> Right, you're, we're back to the sheep again now. <laughs> aye, aye. But that's it. Like, I mean, I work in GEA as well. And like when I finish up working and looking at matches and stuff like that, I've been asked kind of to get involved in teams. And I'm kind of thinking, Jesus, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I have the appetite for that, but you obviously do. I was a, I was a primary school coach in Down for, for uh, nine years before I went to Trinity. Um, and I just felt that at that time it was it was a wee bit challenging because I was coaching during the day, right? And then I was going in the evenings, and it, it, it was getting tough then. But now that I I don't do as much coaching in Trinity, and um, it's sort of more um, admin stuff that it leaves you fresh to go out in the evenings coaching. And okay, listen, I I enjoy, I enjoy it, and listen, it, it's a good thing to be going back and putting something back into the club, like and seeing wee boys. Um, playing sure that, that's what it's all about that's where the most enjoyment is of the whole lot yeah no true and come here you're in with Monaghan this year that kind of had slipped my my uh, radar until I was reading about it this morning Banty has you in as a coach for next year yeah yeah um, I've uh, went to Monaghan now and sort of came as a surprise but uh, it was something that interested me whenever we had our first conversation and we'll, we'll see where that takes us yeah so I presume you're forwards coach I, I'm I'm going to be the on field coach. Okay, so. and just for uh, forwards and backs. Yeah, we're just going to be taking um, myself and Peter Donnelly are, are, are going to be taking um, David McKeggs or as well, but we're going to be taking um, different parts of the whole session completely. Yeah. So right, what what does forward coaching involve now, Connor? Because I'm out of the game a little while, and obviously a lot of the games are dominated by bodies getting back behind the ball maybe not as drastic as they were you know maybe f- four or five years ago but it's still fairly prevalent like what what do you coach forwards now for example that you might not have you might not have got when you were coming up through the ranks maybe just scenario based stuff yeah um, more game based stuff of setting setting the, the other team up in training to, to play similar to what way a team's going to play and different scenarios that might happen in a game and then hopefully um, your players will be will be adaptable in the game, but also they'll be ready and they'll have um, they'll have faced that challenge before. So it should be much easier to overcome whenever they're faced during the actual game itself. Right. So a lot of it would be like you know intricate three or four hand pass moves with someone coming around on a loop. You know, kind of a a, a pre planned thing like that. Maybe and maybe a wee bit of shape and. Um, different positions that you're going to take up are you going to be wide are you, are you going to have width to your game or depth to your game but it's just that it, whatever way the opposition sets up you're going to have to talk about it and create that scenario and then try to deal with it but it's good to let the players themselves work it out and then yeah. come back and give you feedback because if you're telling players what to do once they cross over the white line it's it's them that's in the game it's them that's playing the game they're going to have to make the right decisions at the right time 
Yeah, yeah. And another thing with players as well, if you tell them what to do and you go out to the next game and that doesn't work, they think you don't know what you're talking about. I <laughs> asked that happens a lot of the time. <laughs> but I suppose that is the big thing of asking players to take ownership of things. And I know Jim Gavin does this and the old fashioned way of managing is to say my way or the highway. I haven't been involved in inter-county panels in a while, but I would be very surprised if the good teams do not get a lot of feedback from players, you know, and get them to take ownership, obviously, of of things like that. I think in the modern game, um, managers and coaches have to trust their players. I think that's that's key. The team that you're putting out in the field, that if you trust them, and of course everybody's going to make mistakes, but if they're trying their best and they're, they're being honest, and you're being honest with them, then, listen, you can always overcome anything. Yeah. Talk to us about Kilku this year then, because, like, you obviously, you won six in a row, wasn't it? And then lost last year to Burren, who would be big rivals um, of yours, definitely in the title ranks anyways. And then you came back this year, and now you're back in an Ulster final. So, like, I mean, I presume at the start of the year, it was just winning back that down title was on your horizons. As a, as a squad, whenever our new management come in, we just say that we're going to take each each game at a, at a time um, and fully focus on the challenge ahead, whichever the opposition was, not looking too far ahead of ourselves. And probably in the back of our minds, it was to get our down title back because that hurt us last year and that we didn't perform on the day and we felt that we let ourselves down. We probably let our parish down a wee bit. So we were delighted to get back to that and we really have just been focusing just on the next game and on, on our own performance. Yeah, getting Mickey Moran and Conlet Gilligan in as a management team for any club in the country is a bit of a coup. Once once Paul had stepped away last year, we felt as a club that there was another kick in this team and that we weren't finished and we needed to we needed to make a statement and we needed to get the best men available out there. And we were lucky in a way that we identified Mickey and the the club and the committee and our chairman were brilliant and and they went and got Mickey Moore and, and then through that then we got Conleaf. Right. And did he take much convincing or was he happy? Because I know Slocknail, who he was with, there'd be a lot, there'd probably be similarities between the two communities, would there? Very very similar rural places yeah. and maybe he's seen a bit of that. And then probably he had come up against us, so he knew the the quality and um, what we had within our team. So. No, he was the only man that we spoke to. Right, and he 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 came on board. So, so I presume we're talking about kind of tactical battles. It will it will be a defensive tactical battle on Sunday. They wouldn't be going out on a limb to predict that. Listen, that, that's the modern day game, and I know I know there's people out there that would love fifteen on fifteen, and everybody would. The like, guy would love to go out and play fifteen on fifteen, but football has changed and. Systems have now in place, and it's it's become so technical that that's just the modern game, and that's the way the way it's going to be. And listen, as long as we win, <laughs> that's it. You won't mind. I do. T- I do find that that is the modern game. But when when if you were to see Dublin or Kerry, they'll both get bodies back behind the ball, but they move the ball forward at such pace, and you know, a little bit kind of fearless. They'll move it on by the foot, so they can kind of beat the retreating players, if you know what I mean, where you see other teams and they're so slow with their build-up, they never get an opportunity at the other end, you know, for those one-on-ones. Listen, Dublin and Kerry are the pinnacle of of, a, of whatever each team is trying to get to. Yeah. Everybody would love to be at the same level as them and they've set, a, they've set a great bar, but they also are defensively very well set up. Yeah. But they're, they're brilliant in attack, their pace and their directness um, and their foot passing is it's something that everybody strives to, to be as good as. Yeah, I thought there was evidence of that with you and Derry Gonnelly though. Like, I mean, yourself and Jerome Johnson are left inside and, you know, kick passes, trying to get it down to you as quick as possible to maybe avoid those retreating players. I just think it's every team tries to get the ball from A to B as quick as possible. And that's that's something that a lot of teams throughout the country are trying to do. And if if we can get the ball from our half of the pitch to that, as quick as we can to the opposite half, then you have a better chance of getting scores. Yeah, no, that's true. And so what, I suppose what else has Mickey brought to the to set up? He's kind of a, a unique character. He does no media. Nobody really hears too much from him. He's like the, the godfather of, you know, football. 
he's been around for so long, but you never actually hear from him. He's probably the godfather of coaching, even. Um, yeah. He's just uh, he's just a very nice man, a gentleman um, with a with a ruthless streak in him, but has put serious belief in this team, and we're absolutely delighted to have him as part of it. You know. Yeah, yeah. I suppose confidence he's built up with Slock Nail, you'll definitely be able to lean on that because it's a novel final in a way. Neither team has 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 won it before. Yeah, it's going to be a new name in the cup, and and that's exciting for both clubs. Yeah, exactly. Because I think the last time, the last uh, final you played once was Cross McGlen, who, you know, were dominating Ulster, and then the next time it was Slock Nail, and I think they had won it before, had they? I think they had. I think they had. And that was their second. But listen, that, that, you know, they, it, it, it's good to be able to draw on that experience. But as we we have said, when, once the ball is thrown in, it's it's whatever team performs to their potential best on the day. So you can have all the history and all the experience you like, but once that ball is thrown in, it's whatever team brings um, their best performance is going to win the game. Yeah, no, true, exactly. I'll leave you go. You haven't started on your speech yet or anything like that, or do you just talk off the cuff uh, for your when you win a county title? We haven't won the game yet. <laughs> right, you, so you'll go off the cuff. You won't even tempt fate by... by uh, it's hard to know what to do, really, with a speech, isn't it? I was captain once before of Port Leash for a, a Leinster final, and I didn't know whether... if you If you start preparing it, you think... You're looking too far ahead. It's a it's a weird one for a captain to have to deal with. It doesn't come into the thoughts. All we're concentrating on is our performance um, for the match. Yeah. Okay, Connor, come here. Thanks very much for taking the call and best of luck. No problem. Thanks very much. Okay, so Paddy Power predictions, lads. We're into provincial final time, which is a great time of the year. There's no doubt about that. Connor Laverty, by the way, is a man of a few words. Probably made that life a little bit hard on me there but look <laughs> he's got a big important game coming up yeah. so we'll leave it we'll give him a pass um, for that so the first one we're going to look at is Clonmel Commercials uh, versus Nemo Rangers Paddy Power have the betting in this one Clonmel Commercials 2-1 to one outsiders Nemo Rangers 8-15 to 15. as we know they met in the final in 15 and Clonmel Commercials won it with the very last kick of the game big long ball by Seamus Kennedy Caught, not caught cleanly by Quinn Liv and it broke down. Actually, the GEA tweeted out highlights of this during the week. I was looking at them. Paul Kerrigan has been doing the media this week. He said the sickening part is he didn't even have a chance for an equaliser. It was literally the last kick of the game. And that brings back memories to me. Have you ever been beaten by a, a score like that where you don't have a chance to get it back? It is sickening. Yeah. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. Even if you get one more attack and, you know, it doesn't work out. Yeah. But for the last goal to come in, final whistle, done. It's just heartbreaking stuff, yeah. and the game is just over. Like it's yeah. over. Yeah. 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 Fans and it's just the, the frustration because <laughs> yeah. actually Kerrigan missed a goal opportunity in the second half. He was true one on one. He struck it well, and it came off the outside of the post. So I'm sure this is haunting him. Look, geez, if I didn't even one chance of getting mm. the ball, I could have made up for it or whatever. But this is what he was saying. Their heads would have been wandering, like you know, towards oh, we're going to be you know Munster champions now, whatever, and then gone, <laughs> just like in literally split seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so it's tough enough losing, but like to go from one emotion to you know the the one extreme emotion to another in the space of a couple. That's of That's the seconds. type of losses where you the winning teams jumping around and all the other team are just lying on the ground. Yeah, yeah. just gone, <laughs> just complete. Yeah. There's nothing in the legs. The yeah. only natural reaction is just to fall to the ground. Photographer's dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, the contrast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so he's been talking about injuries, which I thought was interesting enough he's, this is fella's a freak we talked about this and Zach Tuhi and different players who just don't suffer from injuries so with Nemo since I've talked out at senior I've missed two games in 14 years one was a suspension and the other was the first round of a championship which was a meaningless game that's what traditional clubs look at first round of championships as meaningless games <laughs> right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he says with Cork haven't missed too many games none through injury a couple due to selection if a fella told me take Tuesday off I'd find that hard I pride myself on my availability that's an incredible record of, n- of not getting injured I was very surprised to hear that about um, Paul Kerrigan you know because just his style of play yeah he runs very, pretty fast very stocky very explosive you know so I thought he would have been very prone to um, hamstring injuries quad injuries soft yeah. tissue injuries so it's just a testament to how he and I, like when I saw that I was like I'm sure Paul Kerrigan has been like injured plenty of times yeah. you know I, uh, if, if, if I hadn't known that I would have said oh he's had a fairly checkered career with injuries never mind missed two games in 14 years so he, it, like it's obviously testament to what he does 
you know, away from Sometimes he looks stuff. to me, we talked about Richie McCarthy last week, sometimes he looks like he's carrying a bit of junk up top. Maybe he just has his chest built up a lot. He looks he a bit, stocky. He looks he a bit rounded at the yeah, top. At yeah. top, that he, maybe he could be a little bit fitter now. Maybe I, I don't want to be hard on him. I don't know what kind of no, fitness work he does. And what Connor's saying, like I sometimes might assume then he's coming back from injury or something, and he's getting himself back up the pace. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like I know people, yeah, they put on weight in different areas and they put it on easier than others. But um, that is just like you. I remember you saying this before about somebody. Like you just think that's luck. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's genetics and luck. Yeah. Yeah, like, like there has to be there has to be something that, that he's doing as well. Like I'd say, oh, p- part of it is preparation. You know, like yeah. a lot of physios would say that like um, the soft tissue injury should be drastically reduced because of the you know the activation you can do and the work you can do to strengthen your hamstrings and stuff. But I, I that activation is just so oh, boring. I know, but, though, yeah, yeah but I'd say it's just I can't do that. You see them rolling around on them now before. It's like oh. Yeah, I just want to get out and kick a few scores there. That activation, oh, and that they're doing, the, they're down in a squat and they're walking sideways like a duck with the band around their ankles. I'd rather get injured, lads, yeah. than have to go through that shit. Was this happening for the over forties? Was it all the lads? There was with one, the lad, one lad doing it. One lad doing it. But you'd see the young lads in Port Leash doing it when I'd be up training with yeah, the intermediates, too, yeah. and there'd be a few of them to be under foam rollers, and then they'd be doing this activation. And you're trying to pick their brains about what the activation does, and sure, like I mean, they're explaining it and. I don't know. Uh, it just shows you, it just shows your age. Like I'm 41. That, I've no interest in that. Like I mean, I don't want to say it's no good. You know, you're not going to question sports science or whatever. Oh, but yeah. at the same time, it's not for me. Yeah, like it's incredible. Not in my day, like. <laughs> <laughs> but like um, you know, when you have to do 30 minutes of it, you're sort of thinking, "Geez, I could be lifting weights here." You know, you yeah, could it be seems being a bit like more it's useful. not productive. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And like she had experience with a physio recently, and I'd always go back every week, and he'd be like, "Were you doing the stretches?" And you're like. Yeah, always yeah. lie to the physio about the stretches. <laughs> Have you ever followed them to a T? You don't, though, do you? No, that's it. Like, I wish I did because then he's always asking me which one was the worst, or do you remember what they all were? And then you're trying yeah, to remember yeah, yeah, what yeah. it was last week that yeah. he showed me. I never, you'd never follow the physios, yeah. recommend, but they give you too many, anyways. Like, I mean, some of them. You know, there could be four or five different ones, and they explain it to you. There, do you have all them? Yeah, <laughs> no intentions of doing these. Yeah. Like, but they know then when they're stretching you out, they know if you've done your work or not. And then you go, What's your pain threshold? and you're like, Four, it's fine, <laughs> you know, rather yeah. than you're, you're in agony there. Yeah, no, it's definitely uh, ah, look, listen, that's what that's what they have to do now. And you suppose the inter county lads getting there early and doing all that activation and stuff, and it, it obviously does work. One thing I did say the last time we we're talking about this is that I had done everything. Um, with my hamstrings and I was still pulling them and I suppose everything as regards stretching them out making sure they're okay getting rubs on them but one thing I didn't do enough of was leg weights because I always thought I'd lose my speed and now that I've started doing leg weights and don't pull my ha- haven't pulled my hamstring <laughs> all this year I'm thinking Jesus if only I had done the weight well Mick O'Dwyer didn't allow us to do weights and that's when I did it the worst back in 03 I missed the whole I missed the best year Leash ever had when I had a brilliant league and then when Liam Kern started, I kind of half-heartedly did them um, because I started doing them and my legs were so bloody sore, I couldn't run. And I was like, am I trying to get on this team or am I doing yeah. stupid leg weights? Yeah, that yeah. was my attitude. So I just gave up the leg weights on the quiet. Do you know? Because when you're trying in January, February to impress a new manager, you want to be you want to be sprightly. You don't want yeah. to have your legs completely See, dead. The more you do them, you don't get sore anymore. That's well, that's it. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, it, but at the start, with a new manager, you see, days. with a new manager, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. can't take that risk. Yeah. That's it. And you're trying to perform at training, so you're trying to be peak. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Some, with a new manager, you nearly have to be at championship pace earlier, yeah. much yeah. earlier. You know, to be getting making sure you're in the mix. So Seamus Kennedy was talking about Clonmel commercials, and they've had a bit of a turnover since 2015. He says we've probably six or seven lads facing into their first Munster Club final. It's new to them, but there's a good few of us who have had the experience which is good um, the younger lads can draw on that so um, I'd, I'll give Nemo Rangers uh, a reluctant nod this is in Fraher Field um, this is the game this is a deferred game and I think this should be the live game lads Kilku, Nave Connell we'll get on to that that's going to be a boring game mm. it's just going to be boring this won't be as boring um, depending obviously on the conditions both days this will be a better footballing game sometimes I think that the Ulster matches get a better Better, a bigger billing than they should. Now, I'm sorry about that, Conan. I'm glad Stevie <laughs> McDonald. But seriously, you know, I know Kilku and Nave Connell, the betting might be closer, but you have to take into account what kind of a game is that yeah. going to be? It's going to be terrible. I'm just thinking maybe like nobody will watch it if it wasn't live. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. So we might watch this. This is the second game on TG Cahar 
that it's deferred and then you'll see the deferred Leinster final as the third game so they've three games on this Sunday I'm pretty sure what are we going to go in this one lads Clamel commercials I'm going to go with Nemo only the revenge factor and the fact that they're favourites they'll have no no um, lack of motivation yeah. for this one a great uh, victory for football people from Seamus Kennedy so he was saying like people think it's only hard going from football to hurling yeah but he said it's harder to, well, it's hard to get his eye in when he's going from hurling to football so it's about time, some, about yeah. time somebody said it yeah. <laughs> you can stick your chest out now yeah. I remember even going back when you're a young fella going from Gaelic football season into soccer season so I was centre half centre back in soccer and one of the two centre halves so you'd be dealing with high balls and you're coming off GA season and you're running to this ball and it takes a lot of concentration not to stick your hands up oh, and try and catch them. Team, teammate of mine did that, Chad. That's <laughs> a proper full-on catch over his head. It was brilliant. You but weren't it, even mad. You just started take, laughing. It takes you a few soccer games to get back yeah. and go, I'm heading this now. Yeah. You know, it's just get Far your... Far ball for your touch as well. It's a lot different too. But yeah. yeah, no, it is. But who, okay, who are we going oh, to sorry, yeah. Keep going <laughs> off topic here. Yeah. Um, uh, Nemo for me too, but very reluctantly like yourself. Uh, yeah. Memories of the couple of years ago, I think. Maybe reluctantly Nemo as well. Just uh, like Luke Connolly and Barry O'Driscoll, Paul Kerrigan. Yeah. Yeah. Line. More danger up front, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, although Michael Quinlivan uh, will would argue with that. So Nave Connell are eight to eleven favourites um, for this one. Kaku are six to four outsiders. Um, Nave Connell are neither one have have ever won it, as I was saying with uh, Connor Laverty. Um, Leo McLoon was talking about during the week. You were talking to him as well, uh, Conor. Guido showed the way. There's room in Ulster for uh, Donegal teams to advance. So we know Guido last year won it and it was 43 years. It was only the second ever Donegal team. A mad statistic. Maybe that's given him the little motivation to go here. Wait a second now. I'm sure they've always wanted to win it, but it probably does give that bit of confidence and to say we're current Ulster champions instead of maybe the feeling going, geez, we're a little bit off those teams. You know what I mean? In yeah. Ulster. So it probably has given him a little shot in confidence. Yeah, that's great. I actually showed him a picture of um, a pile of Lent these boys in this hydro pool they're all squashed in and he said it was between the second replay and the third replay of the county final so I was like oh did you do that before the Ulster game then against Castle Rathen and he was like no I think we recovered a different way that time <laughs> like, you know so he was sending out for two nights in between yeah. that game so they did celebrate it and yeah. like yeah it's actually interesting I was talking to somebody yesterday about Mickey Moore and Kilku and like you know we were sort of thinking they'd gone backwards a little bit or they weren't at the same heights and apparently Moore said that Kaku really relied on their pace they were just running through people whereas now it's harder to run through people because everybody's more defensive and they're stronger and fitter themselves so that was an interesting one and you know maybe it's changed his approach with them over the years but it's a long winded way of saying that I don't know who's going to win this game so I'm going to wait for you two I think they've Connell or bankers for this lads I think it's going to be an, an arm wrestle and there's probably no better team in the country the, the gas thing is and I was talking to Connor is like the reason they've Connell are usually in stalemates is that they don't really try to attack too fast. They're happy for Kilku to get back in numbers and they'll go up there and then they'll slowly but surely get their way. You know what I mean? Through them, Thompson get a long red three. They're not afraid of that. I remember when Dublin played Tyrone those year, th- that year when they hammered them. They were almost like inviting Tyrone to go on back there, get set up. We're ready for this. We've, we've practiced this and like what Conor Laverty said about coaching nowadays, there's a lot of situation, scenario-based coaching where you leave it up to players, right? So now this is what we're facing and you talk through scenarios of how we get through it. And I think Nave Connell are not afraid of when they get back. I think Kaku, on the other hand, might use the kick pass a little bit faster to try and get it down there before Nave Connell can set up, um, which is a bit of a contrast in the two styles. But we know Dublin, Kerry, like I mentioned to Connor, they'll immediately try and tack it at, at serious pace to get those one-on-ones. Do you know what I mean? Because the one-on-ones are on with most teams now because most teams are attacking with everybody, yeah. you know? So get it down the other end of the field quickly. I think the problem why games turn into stalemates is some teams don't attack at that pace and they're happy with stalemates. You know what I mean? At mm. both ends because maybe that suits them. They're better at both. They're better. They're just better at that. And yeah. I think Nave Connell, when there's a stalemate at both ends for most attacks they'll beat Kilku at that. So that's why I'm going for Nave Connell. Yeah, I, I'm going on what I saw of Kilku last time. I, I, I wasn't awful. I hope that all made sense, by the way. No, no, it did. <laughs> I, I wasn't awful impressed and I thought, um, I thought actually Conor La- uh, Laverty and um, the Jerome, Jerome Johnson Jerome, yeah. were a bit isolated in attack as well. I just think um, I, and their biggest threat actually came from Aaron Brannigan, I thought from centre-back. I think he got 1-1 on the day. 
But just, I think, as you said, Nave Colin are very comfortable in their system, very comfortable in their own skin, that they're very difficult to play against. And they have game changers in McLuhan, uh, the Thompsons, and uh, Owen McGettigan uh, was very good at centre forward against Con Zibbert. So I'm going for Nave Colin. Mm. Conan, I'm going to go with a draw. I think um, I, I don't know. He's placing a bit of stock in Mickey Moore's ability to try and scupper. Yeah, that's one thing that you would that you would put a, you give Kuku a better chance. The evidence of the game against Derry Donnelly though, Kuku weren't great that day. I didn't yeah. know, they weren't. They, they didn't look like they had much about them to be honest. Yeah. And if they want to go down the road of playing defensively against Nave Connell, you know, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's like be like Cavan playing Tyrone. Yeah. Do you know that kind of way? That would be in my head at that kind of system just yeah. won't work the one thing is like Neve Connell are probably the best ball retainers I've seen at club yeah. level in a long time so if Kinku can try to sort of get in amongst that then they'll have a chance I'm just going to go for a draw alright ok so we'll move on to the hurling this time and it's Ballyhale Shamrocks um, obviously Saint Mo- against St Mullins Ballyhale Shamrocks are 1-14 to 14, lads so that, uh, let's, let's not beat around the bush about saying Ballyhale Shamrocks will win this Leinster final you'd be amazed if they don't St Mullins are 8-1 to one. Like, I mean, for St Mullins even to get to the final has been an absolutely incredible journey. You know, from given, from receiving a walkover in the Carlo semi-final, there's only four teams in Carlo. So they had a buy straight into the county final if they wanted it. As a club, they said, no, we don't want this. It was Ballin uh, Killeen and the gate, the Ballin Killeen uh, appealed it. We know this story and the Carlo County Board refused the appeal then they appealed it to Leinster Council and they refused it and it wasn't until St Mullins stepped in and said we want to play them that they actually played it mm. St Mullins then played them they were five down in the second half they were three down into injury time and Marty Cavanagh who else scores a free to bring it to extra time and then they win it in extra time then they go down to 14 men in the county final against Mount Leinster Rangers who were strong favourites um, for the county final down to 14 men in the first half an injury time point wins it for them county final they play Kula Favorite, one of the favourites for the All-Ireland Final in Leinster. It's a late goal to win it by a point. One of their backroom team has a heart attack on the sideline. <laughs> you know, they couldn't even celebrate that. They couldn't yeah. even celebrate that win. Then they move on to Rat Downey Earl. They're underdogs for that one as well. And they're a point down in injury time. And Roy of the Rover stuff, um, two unbelievable points. Do you know what I mean? At the end. And they end up winning that. And then they celebrate that. And now they take on the All-Ireland Champions. Like there, there's a part of me saying like, I mean, Jesus, <laughs> just go and do it with St. Mullins. Like, I mean, the whole country will be behind St. Mullins. No disrespect. Like we all, everyone would have massive respect for Ballyhill Shamrocks. I love them. But Jesus, St. Mullins deserved <laughs> to, yeah. to win this one. Not to dismiss their chances, but they've already had the most amazing season ever. They've yeah. been talking about this season for years to come. Just you we went through everything there. Like, but uh, I still... Uh, the 8-1, like that, that strikes me as an awful... Like, like these lads be cool no, lads. It'd be worth well. a tenner. Yeah, maybe, yeah. It's but in a I, more park. Yeah, yeah. Just just that seems, even those odds seem a little unfair given what they've done to, to get to this point. But yeah, let's not beat around the bush, as you said. I mean, it would be the shock to, to of all shocks if they were to yeah. beat by the hill. You wouldn't be mean. putting them in a, an accumulator. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, you could ch- maybe a fiver at eight to one and maybe see for an interest in it just to really shout them on yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to lose your fiver. But that's it. Sure, we know all about Ballyhill Shamrocks. They have the All-Stars, multiple All-Ireland winners, Enjoy holding TJ Reid, Michael and Colin Fennelly. And then obviously the younger lads, Evan Shefflin, Owen Cody and Adrian Mullen, um, who have become a bit of a, a hit on social media, actually, on Twitter. Cody and uh, Mullen, have you been following them? They're becoming very vocal on, uh, on Twitter, the two of them. Two little messers, I'd say they are. Um, be hard to look past Ballyhill Shamrocks. I'm going for Ballyhill Shamrocks, but I'll be shouting for St. Mullins. I would probably all agree on that. Jesus, I don't know. Will they think you like stirring an emotion inside me when you start <laughs> reading out these? Like, you think um, I'd be good at dressing room speeches? I think so, yeah. I yeah, really I could do a good speech. Yeah. I could do a good speech. Um, I'll tell you what, like, you know, sometimes. I'm hoping to do a good speech tonight against Joe Brawley in oh, this yeah. great debate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably bottle it in front of a crowd. It's easier in front of teammates. <laughs> yeah, right enough. Sometimes, as Mr. Parkinson Sr. would tell you, your name is written on the trophy. <laughs> I'm, you know what? I'm going to go with St. Mullins because if St. Mullins do Good win, man. then I'll look class. And if they don't win, nobody respects my hurling opinion anyway. Well, that's so it. You've nothing to lose on your hurling, yeah. Because this was so one sided, I didn't get Brian Carroll on because I'm sure Brian Carroll would just make a case for, you know, pretty much say exactly what we're saying. 
Um, Connor, yeah, we'll take the mayo. No, I, I, mayo I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be swayed as romantically as Connor was there. <laughs> I, I'm gonna go for uh, the easy option and pick for Buddy Hill. Right. Okay. We'll just finish up with a heads up on two intermediate finals, lads, which would interest the general public. The, the Munster Club football final is Temple No. Uh, we did a good piece with Tyg Morley um, a few weeks ago. They're playing St. Brackens of Clare. They're one to forty to win it. They're going to win it, but just keep your eye out for Temple No. You know they had the four lads on the Kerry senior team. They're sensational. This is a, a we did a piece on Sports Joe Conan about them last year, didn't we? That it's actually not a town. It's nothing. It's yeah. just a church, and they have no national school. Uh, feeding their club which is just so unbelievable yeah. it's, I think it's the unique in the whole country that there isn't a national school feeding you know what I mean the club mm. uh, which is completely unique but they're going to win that one you'd imagine and then the Leinster intermediate final hurling is Tullerone Kilkenny the Walsh's versus uh, Sir Kieran's um, that's Joe Bergen's club I'm fairly sure and that's in Nolan Park so that was obviously decided before the championship started. So Tullerone, you'd imagine they're three to ten favourites to beat Sir Kieran's, who are three to one. Um, uh, home advantage, definitely. And I don't think anybody would be grudging Tommy Walsh, uh, Leinster Club hurling championship. Um, let's just hope that if he's enjoying a moment with his father, yeah. the, a local <laughs> reporter doesn't put prize them, <laughs> prize them apart. Um, maybe he's learned his lesson. So look, we're not going to get predictions on that, lads, because they're fairly obvious. Um, the you know Temple known to their own two of the more high profile intermediate uh, clubs you'd have to say right listen we'll leave it there we will be back on Monday and we'll review the all the finals and we we'll talk to you then good luck.